All right, welcome everybody to another venue webinar. We're going to concentrate on S6L today and its use in immersive systems. Uh, today we're going to have uh, a guest in and uh, we're going to do a little case study today. We're going to kind of, you know, we've been talking about immersive uh, in the lab and a few other places and, you know, it's kind of uh, kind of a great talking point in the industry right now. And um, you know, it's kind of just kind of nice to go out and see it actually in play somewhere and actually get all of that, uh, uh, you know, in play and, and let you see it all and uh, let you see that it's actually real out in the world. There are actually people that are doing it and it's uh, a pretty exciting time. So I'm going to invite in my guest here today. Uh, my guest is John Cornelius. He is the tech director at uh, Orchard Church, Orchard Hill Church. Uh, so we're going to spend a little time just getting to know each other here a little bit, and then we'll go through um, some pictures and I kind of talk you through the system. As you can see, he's got that beautiful background there. That's not a green screen, right, John? No, no, that's <laughs> I'm in front of house, and that's the speakers behind me. So that's right. That's the real thing. All right. Uh, so let's get started here. I, you know, I, you know, start off, John. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, what, what's your background in audio? How'd you get in? Get kind of hooked up with Orchard Hill. Etc. Give us a uh, you know twenty thousand foot flyby there. Let us know. Let us know what you where you came from. Yeah, cool. Uh, I uh, went to school here in Pittsburgh at Duquesne University. Studied audio recording. Um, fast forward a handful of years, I was chasing my wife. She uh, worked at this church. She knew I did some audio. I did some freelance work for them. And then after about three months, I got hired. Uh, it was early in two thousand, and I've been here ever since. Um, so that's how I got hooked up here at the church and. Um, a little bit of my audio background so but uh the church here is uh orchard hill church we're about uh 30 minutes 20 to 30 minutes north of the city center of pittsburgh uh we have two off-site campuses and one in butler a little north of here one in the city um this is, serves as the broadcast um kind of origination point for those two places we do the video teaching there and uh it's been a great organization to be a part of and uh, just did a big remodel which is i guess why we're here today yeah, yeah. So, you know, I was looking at your website. And it looked like, like, are you at the modern looking facility? You know, the place, I, I, a couple of the other buildings that I saw looked like uh, they were, they had been around for a long time. I mean, very traditional looking church buildings, but the building you're in now is Correct. more of a modern kind of, I, I, I go here easily, performing arts style building, right? Totally, yeah. I, I mean, this uh, uh, the architect for this building in 1997 was a theater architect. It is a, you know, it is a theater in how it's laid out and presented as a 250 seat uh, balcony, has uh, about 800 seats on the floor. Um, so it, um, and that way it is kind of like a performing arts space. And actually that was a large part of um, why this remodel even came to be is uh, originally it was very, very much as theater. It was laid out, you know, straight rows, um, and both here on the floor and the balcony. And then uh, we wanted to basically increase focus in all ways, both video, audio, lighting, anything that we could do, we wanted to, that was kind of the overarching big goal of this. So um, we, we did that through seating um, and then, um, you know, immersive finally matured enough and that ended up being um, something that ended up being intriguing, explored, and then ended up executing here in this Right, right. So I, I noticed you, I, I, I thought I heard you say you'd been there since 2000. Is that right? So you've been with the church for 20 years or so? A little over 20 years, correct. Yeah. Yeah. How long has the actual church organization been going? Uh, the church uh, was founded in 1989. Uh, had a couple, had a smaller building on the same property here a while ago in an A-frame type building. Yeah. It built this facility originally in 1997. And then I would say, at least from the auditorium perspective here, we took it down to the walls and redid everything. <laughs> so um, that just happened here, you know, 20 years later from the original. And the original installation was decent. You know, at the time it was pretty state of the art. It's just, you know, 20 year systems, you know, kind of needed sure, to be updated sure. a little bit later. So obviously you're immersive in the, the new space there. Are, are you considering doing kind of adopting that into your other rooms as well? Um, Probably not in the near future. Both those facilities are um, about 200 seat more traditional spaces. So I don't know if that um, I don't know if that would probably apply quite as well in those particular venues. Yeah, yeah. Well, great. I mean, that sounds really cool. So um, let's talk maybe a little bit about uh, 
your may, maybe just talk about your presentations there a little bit. I mean, obviously, it's a church. Uh, we know you're going to have spoken word. That's a given uh, in all of the places. But you obviously do music there as well. Are, are there other types of presentation that you think are served by the the immersive format there, or is it is it primarily spoken word and music? Yeah, that's um, ninety eight percent of what we're doing is you know um, more of a modern worship service where we have you know about twenty minutes to a half hour worth of music presentation worship at the front half of the service about a thirty five minute spoken word message at the end. Sometimes it's you know we mix up that format a little bit, but. Uh, that's what we're doing here, although occasionally there's a couple school, uh, Christian schools in the area that we sometimes offer up our uh, facility to use. They know they'll be here in a, a few weeks doing their end of year concerts and stuff like that, um, that we also support in the community. Right. So I noticed you have, you know, your main sanctuary there. Do you have all, also have like, uh, you know, student ministries, et cetera? Is there PA needs, et cetera, in those, in those other Yes. Areas. Do you guys do that as well? Uh, we have a, <clears throat> just about two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, we opened up a small 300 seat chapel because, you know, a room like this doesn't necessarily do great for smaller life events like weddings, funerals, stuff like that, that, you know, well, the awesome as this room is. So we made a little uh, smaller 300 shape, a little bit of a fan shaped room. Um, again, at that time, immersive wasn't in my brain. So it's a little more of a LCR kind of or, or distributed kind of set up right. but um and you know i would say at least that, get back to your original question whatever maybe consider immersive in that room eh, maybe down the road but <laughs> yeah. well speaking of that I, I mean how many uh and we'll keep this to audio here how many audio staff people do you have uh, working at the church um, or at this facility i should say i'd say yeah th here there uh, i have three people on staff um we all kind of do a little bit of everything um but there's another a woman here, Sarah, who uh, does some of the other mixing responsibilities here at Front House for the most part. And then we also have a handful of volunteers that fill the need from time to time. But And then there's a third technical staff, but he focuses mostly on the video side of things. Right. Okay, well, um, you know, let's uh, let's dig in here a little bit and we'll get to, let's, I, I, you know, we got a little bit of a picture gallery of your space there. So let's have a look at what you got going on there. It's beautiful. All right, so let's do here. All right, so this is just kind of a, a side view of your sanctuary there. I, you know, I got to tell you, I mean, aesthetically, it's absolutely stunningly beautiful. I mean, just great Thank you. facility. Nice, open, bright. It looks like a lot of acoustic work done there as well, right? You, you, uh, you want to give a shout out to, you know, your contractor or your integrator or uh, uh, whoever yeah. did the acoustics? Yeah, so the... Um Actually, I don't remember the acoustician at the moment. I'd have to look at my notes, but um, yeah, the, the no, but nobody ever remembers them unless they're really bad, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's actually a good picture of of the space. You know, we wanted to do obviously audio was a big part of this project, so we wanted to do everything we could to um, both increase the audience participation and get have really great coverage. Um, again, the immersive fit that really well we can talk about that a little bit later but yeah spent a decent amount of time um, those ceiling clouds were made very intentionally to although it is a high ceiling trying to do as much as we could to direct as much audience energy back to them um, yeah and then with anything that the pa or the stage put forward hopefully that would you know get either get diffused or absorbed as much as possible without making the room feel uh, unusually or obnoxiously dead so You're right right yeah, I was, I was so glad to see churches go back to that a little bit, trying to make the, the room more live for the congregation. I, I even noticed your seating and stuff has all hard hard backing, soft fronts, mm -hmm. you know, things like that to really help that situation. Yep. Here's kind of a look at your stage, which again, very clean, very beautiful looking. All right, so let's get to the kind of the heart of the matter here. Let's talk about your PA system. So sure. <clears throat> you've had, uh, uh, you're using L Acoustics, uh, yep. right, with Elisa. Is that correct? Correct, yep. All right, so I've, I, I've kind of taken the liberty. I haven't confirmed this with you, but I'm going to kind of outline these arrays, and you can describe them for you. Sure, sure. Uh, for it. So uh, this looks like the primary front field of your immersive. Is that correct? Right. The, the five in the center, from uh, how L Acoustic calls it, the, to do Elisa, you need to at least have those five arrays in the middle. That's your, it's your scene system. 
the two smaller arrays to the far outsides are what they call extensions. Um, right. And in that, um, mostly, you know, I'm not putting a whole lot of stuff out there other than to create um, space and effects. You know, my reverbs sometimes go out that far, but I'm not necessarily putting instrumentation too much in that. That's just to kind of give a, a nice wide, widening kind of perspective to the whole thing. Right, right. And and you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you only have front field immersive right here. You're not correct. doing a full yeah. surround or anything? Nope, okay. just the front field. Yeah. And then after that, that is your subwoofer system. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. But, and it might just tell us what boxes you're using as well. Can you describe the boxes uh, uh, throughout? So the in the three center arrays, those are L Acoustics A15s. Uh, the rest of the arrays are L Acoustics A10s. Um, I am going to embarrassingly not know the subs right at the second. <laughs> That's um, okay. <laughs> um, other than, yeah, we, we went back and forth, you know, of, of you know, two or uh, whether we could have four or six, and, you know, it shows for the extra headroom, um, you, you know, because we could, uh, or that, that was important to, you know, basically make sure we were working inside the comfortable, you know, range of both the speakers and the amplifiers. So right. uh, while we don't, run the SPL that the system can put out. Uh, we just yeah made sure to have a nice amount of headroom on that, so. You know, the thing that's nice here, and I, I try to point this out every time I see it with Immersive because it's a big deal is, everybody who's watching should actually take note of this, that there are no speakers hanging down into the video screens. Yep. There's no banana hanging in front of the video screens, right? And I, I'm gonna I'm gonna predict that that's good for every seat in the house, right? There's no video screen obstruction. Yeah, of course. PA. Even yes, it, uh, immersive suited this exceptionally well because it was a piece of cake. We could kind of put the PA where we wanted to. We could put the screens where we wanted to. Um, it was a little bit more of a dance early on in the project. You know, uh, only at the beginning of 2019 is when I experienced. Uh, Lisa or immersive at the, for the first time, and uh, we started the project in 2018, and we're really far down the road with a traditional left-right set of arrays. Um, and you know, yeah, had I, I even figured out all the sight lines with that, but yeah, it definitely was much more of a dance um, with those with a yeah traditional left-right system. So yeah, I, yeah, I mean, we look anybody who's been in audio for the past 20 years understands the dance that goes that you go through with mechanically articulated arrays and video screens. I mean, it's the challenge of all challenges, right? Yep. Uh, let's see, what else you got here? So I was gonna ask about this. I didn't ask you about this the other day when we were on the phone, but uh, I'm gonna ask you about it now. So sure. are these little, uh, the ones that are surrounded in turquoise there, are those are, are those a downfill? Yeah, they're just a, a monofill. There are just a few, and I would say maximum like 30 to 50 seats combined, just that were outside of the main coverage pattern of the PA. So I uh, felt it necessary to put, uh, put those there. They're not doing a ton of work, but it is important for those uh, seats pretty far to the outside on the wings. So, and is the in terms of the feed that is going there? Is that is that a kind of flattened mono, or that is, is a, it a, yeah. a spatialized mono? It, it, yeah, I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's just a flattened mono. Uh, yeah. And again, it's just it's just to um, fill in um, just a handful of seats. Uh, right. Right. And then I'm going to actually drop down here because I kind of noticed this this morning. Is this a front fill system that is built in there? Yes, that is just a front fill system. It is not an immersive front fill. Um, right. At the time of the design of this, that wasn't completely available with uh, Elisa. Right. Um, there were, I, I think you can get it now. Um, it, it yeah, that's correct. Yeah. It increases the cost a good bit. Um, but, and I would have loved to have done that. But at, at this point, it's I think it's just a two or th maybe three or four different zones of a mono. Flat and mono. It's cool though. Looks good. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let me see if I got any other questions to go through here. So, um, you know, I noticed I, I I may end up jumping around here a little bit asking some of these questions, but I noticed that you got your drum kit off to one side of the stage, and I, you know, I, I, honestly, I see this more in in churches than than anywhere. Uh, are you using immersive to? localize that drum kit in that position or, or in terms of mix are you mm -hmm. presenting it in the center of the room uh it's not necessarily localized as far off stage as that is but it is edged towards that uh the uh the kick and the snare are actually between uh scenes three and four so yeah. about so they present you know about where the subwoofers are um also um when el acoustics was here and you know giving me some tips and tricks on that they actually um at least Josh recommended putting your low frequency information between those first and um, 
the center and the outside array, because then you actually get um, the 15s on both those arrays working together and fully, and you actually get a little more impact that way than trying to yeah. just jam it up the middle. Um, so in that way too, the bass guitar is actually shifted a little far off to the left there. Um, and while it is not truly centered, uh, for the most part, uh, you don't necessarily feel that um, too much. The, yeah, the Tom Tom hit on the, the rack Tom, which is ends up being presenting house right a little bit. He probably ends up feeling a little towards the screen. So it, in that way, it's a little hype to the outside. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, we have, I am presenting it a little bit off to the right uh, to uh, kind of because I can and um, I'm doing as much as I can actually from a mixed perspective overall to just try to get things if they're maybe not totally perfect, but you're trying to get them that they present acoustically yeah. where they're positioned on stage, which I think is one of the beautiful things about immersive. I, I totally agree with you there. And, you know, I, and I, I say this just from, uh, from going to churches and helping them out and uh, dealing with this situation in stereo. It's one of the hardest things to deal with in stereo when you got your acoustic drum kit off to one side of the stage and are having to compete with that acoustic energy with a stereo PA mm -hmm. system. And where do you put the drum kit? You know, right. it, man, it's it's tough. And, and I, I'm with you. I think, you know, immersive, especially front field immersive object mixing, almost almost solves that problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can make it so believable that the kit is coming from there. You know, it's really really great. Yep. I'm a big fan. So, uh, in terms of spoken word, you know, I'm going to guess that your pastor works primarily down center. Yep. Uh, does he move? you know, enough for you to, to warrant you having a tracker or does he work from a podium or anything like that? Uh, my pastor does move enough to probably warrant a tracker. So far, we haven't explored that. Uh, you know, if, as in many projects like this, you know, you're giving, you're doing gives and takes on all sorts of things. And sure. Um, the tracking is something I left on the ground for now. Uh, I look forward to experimenting that. But um, even with, um, I would say what I have chosen very intentionally to do with that, even though he does move around, probably if you see the uh, five, uh, the, the four footlights there, he works between the outside of those and the inside of those outside two footlights. Um, I definitely, I've placed him fairly center and fairly narrow um, because uh, again, actually when I experienced this for the first time in L Acoustics demo room, um, granted the point that the demo was music, but when they switched from stereo to Elisa, um, what I, was the most remarkable thing to me is the vocal all of a sudden became extremely, extremely centered and it right. blew me away. And yeah. it, now, of course, I felt wonderful for the music and I thought, oh, you know, creatively that was, wow, look at the possibilities. But also too, I almost immediately thought too, this is wonderful because now, of course, we have screens, we have cameras, we have lights, we can, you know, you could try to do what you can visually to support the pastor being centered. But now for the first time ever, other than hanging a center array just for speech, which you know plenty of churches have done that have the budget and the time for it. Um, now that to have the, the spoken word presentation to emanate from center, it's it's been amazing to notice how many people, also accentuated by the the rap that we did with the seats, but less people are watching Pastor on IMAG <laughs> than were before. Because even when people would you know, see in that right section when we had straight, straight oriented seating, you know, they would look at that screen off to their right. Um, and also that's because the, the, the sound was coming from over there as well. So right, right. So now that you can take what's exciting to me about immersive, and especially since for churches, because, you know, we spend more of our time generally in spoken word than we do in music. So nailing that part of your presentation is extremely, extremely important. So now to be able to use audio to direct people's attention, that was actually, that was what sold immersive the most for me when I experienced it in the demo room. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100% there. I, the the very first times that I experienced immersive in that setting, and it was with a spoken word, it wasn't necessarily in a church setting, but it was in a corporate kind of setting. Uh, I just remember having this overwhelming sense of, wow, this is the solution for the churches. This is the solution for the churches because it's that best hybrid of, of kind of stereo music concepts, you know, positional music concepts mm -hmm. and spoke, spoken word. I mean, why would you ever go to these, you know, center clusters strictly for vocal and stereo just for music when you have this kind of thing at your at your option now? You know, I just 
it just seems so perfectly suited for that workflow. I was, I was very happy to see it. I just remember thinking, wow, this is it. We made it. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's move on a little bit. Let's talk, let's talk a little bit about your interface here. Um, this looks like some racks in your machine room. Yep. Uh, looks like a couple of Elisa processors up there, which I didn't take the time to highlight. I apologize for that. And then a Wave Sound Grid server. <clears throat> that looks like a Stage 64 there. And your engine, I, and I noticed your engine is remotely located there, right? So yes. uh, it's not at your front of house position. That's great. That's kind of a neat thing. It's kind of unique to Avid console designs that we can separate that engine from the, the surface like that. So that's cool. So uh, what, are, what are you actually using? I, I noticed that the engine is here and the Elisa processors are here. So I'm going to make this assumption. Are you driving Elisa with Matty? Yes. With Matty cards right from that engine? Is that the idea? Correct. Yeah. Everything is Matty uh, to the Elisa and then, of course, from the Elisa. And I think that at this point, that's all acoustics had to offer, although I hear networked solutions are in the future yeah uh, but uh so yeah all maddie uh, and then above the elisa controller that's kind of the a little bit of a heartbeat of it all is that avitran audio toolbox that's doing a lot of uh format conversion for us so getting the maddie um to avb for um the uh, uh sorry the acoustics amplification um too so that you know that's that was actually a, we spent so many months uh with <laughs> trying to figure out how to you know get maddie in and then get to the avb and then we wanted to, i wanted to get some we have some other facilities that have some dante in it so being able to move um audio around the facility fairly effortlessly wanted to have some sort of you know small amount of dante io to, to do so um yeah. again using that audio toolbox ended up being the perfect tool for the job as opposed to having three four five different pieces of you know don't get me wrong, RME, um, uh, shoot, Focusrite makes some really great options, but to uh, do the whole channel count that I was looking to do, um, that got pretty costly fast, so. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's great that you were able to find a solution here. I, I think there's a lot of really good stuff on the horizon right now for you mm -hmm. uh, to do those very things. I, I, it's just right around the corner. I mean, you know, just a, a, lot, of, a lot of companies, Avid included, you know, now supporting Milan, uh, you know, a lot of these processors are going to support Milan now. So totally. it's, it's going to be a really, really great way to do it. This installation will be way easier in about one to two years. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well put. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Let's move on here. Maybe, what do we get next? Oh, and I, you know, I didn't, I didn't know you had, we're incorporating stage 32s, but it looks like you have stage 32s in a couple of locations as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. So on stage IO is basically <clears throat> handed by the stage 32s. Most of the, um, while I would have loved to have also um, updated my wireless, which is in a different rack there, I still have a decent amount of analog wireless. Um, so that's what that stage 64 is taking in mostly on the analog side, um, on the inputs and then the outputs uh, on the in that rack room are serving our the, as the front end for our live mix, uh, digital audio labs, personal monitoring system. So, but then, but yeah, the uh, uh, basically the, all the stage IO is handled between those stage 32s and then uh, at least on the stage uh, right one, have one output card just for utility when you need to get, you know, something yeah. out there. Yeah. Yeah, it looks great. So you got uh, three IO nodes on this system then, uh, a stage 64 and two stage 32s, right? Correct, yep. Right. All right. And here is your gorgeous front of house position. So you're on stage uh, S6L32D there. And you're, you're mixing front of house and monitors from this position, right? As well as doing the immersive thing. Yes. So, is that right? Yep. Yep. Uh, you now we're using, like many churches, we're using a uh, personal monitoring system. In our case, it's Digital Audio Labs Live Mix. Um, again, the analog front end for that is in um, the rack room. It was going to be digital, but then again, had so many different digital formats in and out that eventually was like, okay, it's actually easy. You know, did the latency calculations on the analog stuff. It was going to be similar to all the digital conversion format conversions because um, I had to knock it down to 48K and a couple other things like that. So, um, so yeah, I have I have most either the uh, personal monitoring system is kind of dealt with eat some direct outs um, for individual channels and then auxiliaries that making you know, doing stems and submixes to you know, fit inside that twenty four input format for the folks on stage. Right. So are you doing like a, are you duplicating inputs on the console per se and making yeah. like a set of monitor inputs and then a set of inputts that drive through objects to yeah, the immersive? Yeah. So with the immersive, uh, I've um, 
you know, just because this is where Elacoustic steered me initially, and I'll, and I've only been at this about three months, I'll probably start to work on some bus uh, paths for immersive, but at the, right now I'm 100% object-based. Um, so then having to deal with monitor inputs then meant just, yeah, duplicating an input and providing a direct output uh, to the Stage 64 yeah, for yeah. monitoring. Um, but you know, yeah, it initially bought the 112 engine, upgraded to a 144 uh, to get the extra uh, channel count to make some of that possible. But that's it's actually been working out great. Uh, you know. Oh, it's. I mean, that's such a great workflow in digital, especially for mixing front of house and monitors, just to quickly, I mean, immediately be able to, you know, duplicate and triplicate channels as needed totally. for monitors. It's just an absolute lifesaver in that situation. So you got your hand full out there. I mean, doing front of house mix, monitor mix, uh, you yeah, know. Yeah, the monitor thing, it gets pretty easy because, you know, at the end of the day, you provide 24 inputs or stems to the musicians. They kind of take care of themselves at that point. What's wonderful about, you know, S6L, and now it's even say it's, you know, the workflow of the of the desk, you know, I just have a layout that's all the monitor stuff. It just presents on one input, you know, and I need to get to that, press a button, you're there, everything's right in front of me. It's, you know, just a piece of cake to kind of deal with. So right, right, once I figured absolutely. out the patching, it was easy to execute. And are you using, uh, I'm, I'm gonna guess you're taking advantage of the Elisa plugin that runs on S6L, right? Yep, yep. Uh, I'm not using it on, I, I early on, put it on a lot of things and then realized I wasn't touching it on some, <laughs> on some things, but yeah, on, uh, mostly on vocals and then some guitars and stuff like that that I maybe wanna move around from time to time, depending on the, the band. Yeah, uh, I think that's an interesting point. You know, I, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, they think, well, if I'm gonna use objects with S6L, I have to have the plugin on. And you don't necessarily, you know, the only reason you have the plugin on the console is so that you have access to control, remotely control that position of that object within mm -hmm. the Elisa software, right? So uh, it, it, as long as you have a direct out or any output path available for it, you can use it as an object in Elisa. Yep. How about, uh, I mean, speaking of that, how about a virtual sound check, right? Are you doing, uh, you're using virtual sound check? You got a recorder set up there and using that to, you know, set some of your positioning in the immersive field? Is yep, that... yep, I have a Mac mini hidden in here that's um, had a remote into to get started stopped. But um, yeah, that's, I mean, I've been, uh, I've actually been on profile before this for at least 10 to 12 years. So um, was well familiar with virtual sound check. And I would say it, it was a, security blanket <laughs> in this conversion because we actually uh you know no construction project ends when you want it to um our first weekend was the uh, first week of december and of course christmas was right on its heels we do a fairly decent size production so i had to get spun up and comfortable on this fast so um you know there was a lot of you know we got through that first weekend which was a little bit of a run and gun and then you know and beautifully then now had a pile of tracks to deal with and then you know spend a decent amount of time just yeah working in the shed basically just trying to yeah, yeah. learn you know uh guys from the logistics mixed the first night i did the second night and then you know after that it's like yeah thrown in the deep end so then it was wonderful <laughs> virtual sound check was tremendous for you know helping me get comfortable as fast as i could because yeah i didn't have to experiment with an audience all the time well, yeah, I mean, what you just described there is a textbook use case for virtual sound check, right? That's exactly why it's around to help that sort of thing. And I think, I personally think it's going to be totally invaluable in immersive setups, you know, where you're, you know, maybe doing design, presenting ideas to an artist or, yep. you know, even a senior staff, et cetera, totally. to get them to understand what's going on, let alone be able to practice with it and because you know, immersive in terms of output structure is way more complex than a, a traditional left-right. So, you know, you don't you don't necessarily want to be experimenting during the the event. You know, well, and I had a great example of that last I think it was last week or two weeks ago where um, I watching one of your labs. I had, had a couple ideas I wanted to goof around with and you know experiment with for two or three hours, and some of it worked, <laughs> some of it didn't for at least my, how I wanted to work, and got to the end of it and was like, well, I'm not going to keep this, but the exercise was was very important and I learned a lot. So even right. though I didn't necessarily keep all of it. So well virtual sound checks is important to learn what you shouldn't do as well as totally. <laughs> what you should do. <laughs> uh let's see. Uh, you know I, I, I'm gonna assume you're up on venue seven. Are you are you on uh venue seven software at this point? Uh yeah actually I the same thing uh unfortunately you know we launched in December and you know was trying to learn a bunch of stuff. I 
and when you guys, I can't remember when you dropped Venue 7. It was kind of mid-December. Uh, December, yeah. I desperately wanted to go to it, but, you know, since I was in the middle of, you know, basically a two-week, three-week production, it didn't feel wise to switch over. But um, I was looking forward to so many things, and I would say, the, especially the tool that I've used, the one feature that was in Venue 7 that I probably latched onto the most is the parallel pads on individual channels. Um, because I'm doing immersive and because I've abandoned much of my bus workflow for parallel compression, say for instance, drums or stuff like that, or let's use that as an example. Um, I'm doing that on a per channel base now because I am also presenting those uh, inputs to the PA as individual sources too. So yeah. um, the parallel compression on or the parallel processing on the channels has been a wonderful thing to, you know, get the sounds I was still look, trying to get, but without having to, at least at this point, you know, do it through a bus. Again, I'll, I'm a, still a baby in this and I may end up going to, you know, a bus path for drums down the road. But right now I'm kind of giddy on the power of, you know, being able to place things individually. And it's, yeah. it's just kind of fun and exciting to experiment with. Well, I'm, I'm so glad to hear you latched onto the parallel compression and just maybe for people that don't know it, I'll explain it. You know, there is the ability on SXL now with Venue 7 on every input and every output to parallel compress on the channel. And you do it with a, you know, a blending knob, a 50-50 knob, you know, it can be any ratio you want. So you can have parallel compression, parallel gating, even parallel equalization, which kind of works as a scaler uh, on, the, on the EQ. So you have that available to you on every input and output. So uh, your ability to parallel process is greatly, greatly enhanced quickly in mm -hmm. Venue 7. You can do it very, very quickly, very simply. And, and, you know, that actually kind of drives me to another question here, John, you know, um, actually, let me just get through the slide here real quick and make sure we're okay. Yeah, I kind of missed this. We're, this is the, uh, that's obviously the Elisa plugin operating on Venue uh, mm -hmm. on S6L there on the left. And that is one of your live mix artist controllers on the right. Is that right? Yep. So, Correct, yep. so it looks like the artist control thing is uh, that 24 sources. Can you take into that? Is that right? Correct, 24 sources, and then actually there's, it actually serves two people, as you probably see there on the top. There's an A and a B side. So uh, I would say it's a nice thing about the product. It also can be a bad thing about the product if your artists aren't uh, being careful, because all of a sudden, you know, Joe, you know, Joe takes care of what Tom was hearing. Um, <laughs> but generally, they, after, you know, one or two times around with volunteers, they eventually get the hang of that so that they're not wrecking other people's mixes. Right, right. Um, but uh, but it, it's a great space saver on stage because you know no one necessarily likes to see those things either. So having being able to serve two artists from one one box is pretty keen. So you know so kind of going back to your uh, some of the earlier pictures, you know I noticed there were keyboard on stage and your drums on stage. Is, is that the only live instrumentation on stage? Is there, is there any uh, any amplifiers anything like that? Going no, I, so yeah, great <clears throat> question. Um, uh, we just completely shifted over now to where we have a couple house ones. Uh, uh, the a main guitarist and music director here is a, uh, has got into Kemper's and um, he had, nice. has one and then we have now a house one. So those have been wonderful. Uh, um, so before we used to do, we had a room off stage where I would run uh, guitar cabinets too. So we'd have some heads on stage and run uh, long cables too. But, um, but yeah, we've been, fortunately I've been able to work with a fairly clean stage both from uh, acoustic sources and from, you know, not having, you know, large right. amplifier stacks or anything like that. Yeah. Those Kemper models are just ridiculously good. I, I am so blown away by that box. So well, it, great. It's also nice too, because you know, at least for where we are here and we're just starting to get into that. And actually in our broadcast room, I have a little rig set up for them, uh, for the guitars, you know, for the folks that are used to having amplifiers and, you know, don't have a Kemper at home. Um, we are just what we're going to work to do over the next several months is just you know bring their amps in model them so that they're you know working with something on that that feels like home to them and so that's you know hopefully not an obstacle to them you know switching over and being like no no i need to use my head so that's so great i mean i i mean i just think back to where we were even 10 years ago with this kind of stuff man i mean good grief it comes so far here so great uh, let's, you know, kind of speaking of your broadcast area, let's take, have a quick look at that. So you have a second S6L <clears throat> that is in a broadcast zone. Yep. Looks like it's a 24C. Uh, so just walk us through that. Walk us through what you're doing with that every week. Well, it's funny. This was a, this was a late add to uh, this project. Um, but 
as you know, we've been here with COVID for now for a year, basically the initial scope of the project was basically like deal with the uh, in, in room, in-person experience. So while we were already streaming a little bit, of course, like every other church on earth, COVID hit, now streaming became the thing. So, um, so to make the broadcast, uh, the audio side of that better, uh, we at the very last minute, I mean, we, I think we purchased this in mid-November and designed this part and added this on. Um, so yeah, it shows a 24C because you know, there's no reason to, you know, love the venue platform, no reason to go away from it, IO sharing, um, all those things that are great. And so, you, so you guys are using input sharing and gain tracking with those yeah, two systems? Yeah. Absolutely. And then also, um, you know, they we're still, again, we're three months in, um, again, we're still a little COVID, you know, I have, we are not fully utilizing this broadcast room quite yet because, you know, having, uh, but that needs to be a volunteer position for us and uh, getting people spun up on that and that people that are actually really good at that are some of our more cautious uh, health perspective folk. So um, as vaccines are rolling out, we're going to be able to utilize this room a little more fully. Um, but yeah, using the gain tracking and then also buy an additional MADI card for the um, front of house S6Ls to pass, um, pass audio between the two desks. So down the road might work into, you know, maybe doing some stem mixing from front of house to, to mm -hmm. see if they want to accept that or, you know, as we learn how to leverage that, that room better. Yeah, sounds great. Sounds great. Well, that's very, very cool, man. Looks really, really great. So let's uh, I want to let's just jump into a little bit of discussion here about um, and again I you know I think this is where um, things like immersive and uh, you know the technology that we have now actually complement each other so well you know I mean it's not lost on anybody that uh, certainly even at the mixer level you know we have a complexity going on in digital mixing today that is is really kind of startling and uh, you know you work in an environment obviously that takes advantage of volunteers at times and, uh, you know, may not have the most experienced staff working the console at times. So my, my question to you really kind of boils down to this. Do you think this combination of digital mixing and immersive object-based mixing, do you think that has simplified it for everybody? I, it, it is my sense that it has and should actually make it easier for some to, someone to walk up and kind of get sounds and get going. Do you think that do you agree with that? You think that's, that's the way we're heading. I do. And, I, you know, again, because of COVID, we haven't necessarily fully leaned into volunteers with this setup yet. Um, we will be getting there very soon. Um, I look forward to um, equipping volunteers or exposing volunteers to this that mix because, yeah, um, again, but you said that well with digital mixing systems, especially if you start to use bus processing, um, those things can become very hidden. And, you know, people lean into a bus processor or compressor or something too hard and they, can't necessarily tell why what's happening is happening. So to, uh, with the object based and immersive, you know, it's the fader is kind of, you know, it's pretty much all there on the fader. Right, um, right. That, that's kind of where I was heading with it. You know, you push up the fader, you hear something. Right. You know, that's got to be liberating to some degree for people that are that are new to it, you know. Right. Or if you're like here, oh, that's overly <clears throat> compressed. Well, that's it's going to be right in front. It's going to be one of those things that's right in front of you on right the strip. Right in front of you, yeah. So that part is, is really great. And then um, just from once you know it takes a takes a afternoon to kind of you know wrap your head around how this you know this is working well oh, i'm not assigning it to a left right bus and such stuff like that but um the amount of what immersive does with the amount of perceived space you have to mix into so to speak is really really great um you know things that take up a lot of space that can you know like electric guitars like i have them um on the outsides of the space where I can leave kind of, you know, the, up the middle, pretty open for, uh, for vocals to, you know, increase. It's just easier to, with all those, even if you have a fairly dense mix with a, you know, a handful of keyboards, yeah. a handful of electric cars, some tracks, like it's a lot easier to, to kind of with immerse, immersive to find those little spaces to kind of put them into. Um, and cause you can make them almost as small as you want to in a certain regard. And then if you want to, if you want to make them huge, you can also do that well and spread them, you know, even a mono source through three arrays and through the whatever magic yeah. that they're doing there with decorrelation to make that possible. But <laughs> yeah, I, I, again, it kind of gets back to, you know, my, you know, that feeling of my gosh, this is a, this is an incredible solution for churches, you know, where you have, I, I mean, I've been to churches where you might have six acoustic guitars on stage, mm -hmm. you know, and it, that idea of getting, being able to easily separate instrumentation and immersive mm -hmm. is so prevalent 
so much more pronounced than it is in a left-right mix. Like being able to create separation in the audio field that is in front of you, that is just so much easier in immersive. So again, for the inexperienced mixer, you know, that's got to be an asset for them to be able to just kind of go, oh, let me put it over here, let me put it over here. But, yeah, I can hear those, you know, blah, blah, blah. But so. also, you know, it's, it's, it, it, you know, we're again, we're about two, three months into this, you know, the musicians that serve here and, you know, while they're not on stage, you know, many of them have come up to me and it's like, they're just blown away with how well you can pick out the different right. as, different parts of a mix and <clears throat> being immersive, you know, feeds into that really, really well. And then even people that don't have the language for that, uh, even I got a, a text after last Sunday, the last service last Sunday, where they sat in the balcony and they're just like, it, you know, basically all they can say is it was so clear. Um, yeah. that, that, that's about the only language they can come up with for that, which is great. But um, it is that overwhelmingly people have definitely noticed the difference are blown away. And yeah, one of, the, one of the musician people even came up to me two weekends ago. He's like, he's like, wow, the decay on the symbols is amazing. I'm like, you're even paying attention <laughs> to that? Like, <laughs> like, oh, now good. see, at least he didn't say, how come the symbols are so loud? I can't hear the vocal, right? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> that's the one. All right, well, uh, John, this has been fantastic, man. I, I mean, uh, congratulations to you guys for pulling together such a great looking system there. And I'm so glad you're having such great success with it. I think we'll probably uh, take a few minutes here and maybe we'll open up to some Q&A and uh, see if my, my compadres in the background have any questions. Hey guys, that was hey, awesome. Chad. Hey man. Uh, yeah, there's a few questions that came in, and I'll just throw them out there. Uh, John will be able to answer most of them. I'm a, I'm a I would prefer here. that John answer most of them. <laughs> so we'll start with uh, the first one. Did you need speakers under the balcony for this? Uh, yes, actually, that's a good question. Um, we, what was wonderful about moving to immersive was the uh, how it did change the fill systems. Um, yes, there there were it was necessary. Our, I'm right at the edge of the balcony right now. It's not exceptionally deep there. We did need some under balcony filled for people that maybe were hanging out on the back wall the last uh, row or two. But what when we were with the uh, traditional lift right away to cover well in the balcony, we did have a ring of smaller speakers to do balcony fill. Um, once we switched to, um, and this is actually why even immersive was a little bit possible because um, at least the, the L acoustic solution, we lost a lot of, speakers and amplifiers that we were doing for fill because the very main immersive system covered all that well. So that was one of the things that at least immersive made the, it made the PA deployment in a certain regard simpler, even though it's not completely simple, but um, it, yeah, overwhelmingly what you see on the picture there is what, you know, those seven arrays are doing 98% of the work. There's a little bit of front fill, there's a little bit under balcony fill, but the, you know, on the far outsides of the rooms, you know, they're, they're being covered by those, those main front arrays. Nice, very yeah, cool. Nice stuff. Uh, let's see. Why fly the subs instead of them being hung? I mean, instead of being under the stage. Robert's a better systems guy than I am on this, but <laughs> so I'll do my best, and then he can say what I said wrong. Um, I think what, what how L acoustics would answer that is it just it just keeps all the timing uh, timing together there, so that. Um, at, Again, I don't know. I don't have the language for this very well, but everything in, in an acoustics, at least the system, is pretty much timed to that center array, and then everything kind of emanates or works works out from there. So having the center array work out in tandem with each other, so getting the subwoofers as close as they can to make sure that all the phase and the alignment of that is as tight as possible is where they start. And then if you, I, we could have, and it was part of an early part of the design. If you'd like to have floor deployed subs, they can work that in. But I think, especially for Elisa and Elacusis is doing almost all of those designs at this point, they're starting to open up to other people, but um, they really want those subs to be right up, right up against that, either behind or flanking that uh, center array. Yeah, yeah. I, you're you're on the mark there, John. I mean, that's, that's essentially what's going on there. <clears throat> um, you know, part of the, the thing you have to remember in immersive, right, is that that center array typically is going to carry your power elements, right? It's going to typically carry your drums, your bass, your vocals, et cetera. And that needs to be of a kind of a, a magnitude, I guess is the right word to use, maybe not, <clears throat> to compete with what used to be two arrays, right? So in terms of its power capability, its output capability, excuse me, <clears throat> it's got to be able to hang with that. So, you know, that that's part of the reason for 
condensing that speaker system up in, into that center. But the other piece of it is, and you can do ground fill sub, uh, and it, but it's primarily there to pull attention down, right? So that you're not, your attention is not directed up to low frequency. That always feels odd when that is going on. Uh, so a lot of, you know, I think in, in their immersive designs, any PA design, you know, a lot of times you'll put ground fill uh, subs down just to pull attention down and they're not, don't have to be very loud to do it. That's the kind of cool thing about their, about that. You know, they can be down on that ground. You might even cross them over slightly different uh, so that they're a little more complementary of each other, but just something to get that energy or that focus pulled down for the bottom, for the bottom end. So, and my yeah. experience here has been that that even having them flown there, I, I haven't, even from my perspective, I haven't felt like the, the low end's coming from up up on high. And yeah. th and, the, and I would say from even when I was doing, again, back to when I was just considering a left-right system, I was probably, I was leaning towards both for space considerations because we don't have a ton of room under the stage, but I was mostly going to fly the subs anyway, but mostly for coverage reasons. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it does help. I mean, you know, as we all talk about all the time, you know, audio is just managing your trade-offs, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, having those flown subwoofers up there gets you better alignment through the crossover point, no doubt about it, right? And, you know, having them kind of centrally located means your horizontal coverage of that subwoofer energy is going to be really, really good. It's going mm -hmm. to have little to no comb filtering in it, no nulls anywhere in the room. So it just translates to, you know, more focus, less cancellations, et cetera. It's a, it's a good thing. It's a good thing when it's done right. Cool. So one more about speakers. Uh, I understand you have three hangs with A15s, two with A10s, but shouldn't all five front hangs be identical? Uh, I'll do it again. This, this would be a better uh, al acoustics question if there was someone here. Unfortunately, there isn't. But um, my version of ALISA is what they call a focus system, where they even um, the speaker the speakers aren't even evenly spaced out. Those three are a little tighter together. Again, it's a little more for to give impact and, and strength to the center of it. And then um, it's then is acceptable for um, the outside arrays to maybe have a little less power. Again, that, you know, the whatever magic gnomes they put in that Elisa controller, um, they have done a very great job of, even though it goes from a, you know, a 15 to a 12 on the outside, um, they've done in their processing, you can move something not that you probably want to do this time, but you can move something dynamically into that smaller speaker and it really doesn't, sure, it sounds a little bit different. It's almost impossible for it not to, but they've done a wonderful job of making that feel pretty even all the way across the front field, even moving between the smaller and larger arrays. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I, how long have you been mixing now in Elisa? Sorry, Robert. That's all right. Go ahead. I'll, I'll let you finish up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it was installed on the first weekend of December. So it's what, about three months. And actually we had a, about two or three weeks off because we had a little bit of a staff COVID outbreak in early January. So I would say, I feel like I'm a baby at this. I'm still learning things every every week, every time I'm behind the console. Um, it's been a thrill and a joy to mix on. Um, so I'm, I'm only looking forward to making this thing be able to sing even better than it does now, but out of the box, it's been great. Well, maybe we need to check in with you about uh, about every six months, John. We'll have you on every six months, just kind of check in and see, take your temperature, see how it's going. Yeah. Cool. Robert, did you have something to add about the front fill, the five? Uh, no, that's all right. John John covered it well. It's fine. Okay, that's fine. cool. Very cool. Uh, how many objects are you typically mixing during a service? Huh. Um, that's a good question. This weekend will be pretty minimal. And actually, I'm, uh, one of the things I'm kind of looking forward to, I'm pretty most, most of the time we've been doing normal, I'd say, let's say, call it for lack of a better term, rock show worship. Um, this weekend, we're doing two acoustic guitars and a keyboard and a couple vocals. So it would be interesting to play around with, mess around with, what does this, how does this work? How does this, how do I leverage this in a smaller, more intimate kind of uh, setting? So I look forward to that. But um, I would guess real inputs that we're, I'm doing most weekends is probably in the 40 to 50 uh, range. There's a lot more, there's a lot more patch to the, you know, for flexibility. And so you don't have to, you know, patch direct outputs all the time. So I have a lot of things on the console that I just say I have every week, just so I can patch it quickly and go. Um, but I have in at least a controller, I probably have about 80 of the inputs already kind of soft patch, at least for flexibility sake, but generally about 40 to 50 inputs probably to the controller per week. That's good. That's healthy, man. That's a, nice. that's a lot. That's a lot. Very that's cool. Good. 
Um, is the broadcast stereo then? I know you have a separate uh, console set up for that. Is are you broadcasting in stereo? Yeah, correct. That that is strictly a stereo setup. Um, that is uh, would be that mix would go straight to the uh, streaming encoder. So. Cool. A couple of questions about IEMs. Uh, so are you using immersive IEMs? I know you talked a little bit about this, but I want to cover that again. Uh, are you no, using the live mix? Uh, yeah, the live mix is just a stereo uh, product. It's not, um, shoot, I can't remember what the immersive pro uh, offering is. Um, and that, that'd be a fun thing to mess around with, but uh, so far it's not something, we were already using this these uh, systems in other, in our other offsite venues and then our chapel. So. Um, kind of stuck with that for just a convenience and, you know, when something goes down, it's easy to swap um, kind of perspective. Um, and then the other thing about that I like about the, um, at least this offering, not that other manufacturers don't do it, but the, um, those uh, mixers like uh, Robert showed earlier, they have, um, they're just a remote control, basically. I mean, sure, the audio comes out of it if you're right there, but um, there's a D to A box that they offer, which so, uh, you could just assign the output of that mixer to uh, D to A, and then that goes into a PSM 900 uh, wireless system. So for, so some people are, you know, like the drummer or the keyboard, some people that make sense for it to be wired, but then we have eight wireless systems that are remote controlled by those and then are get sent to the transmitter there in the rack room with a short cable run, so. Great. Awesome. awesome. It's good stuff, man. Really good. Uh, I don't know what, how are we doing on time here. How are we doing? Yeah, we got a few more minutes here. We can okay. we can go right to the top of the hour here if you want. Is the SXL fully loaded? That's one of them. Uh, I have the 144 engine. Um, I only have the one um, DSP card in it, and then so I'm using you know some AX plugins. I'm using obviously we saw the SoundGrid server. I'm using some Wave server. So yeah, fully loaded. No, I could throw some more DSP cards in it. Um, I would love to maybe have the next engine up. I'm starting to tickle towards the top of my channel <laughs> cap, um, but I've already I've already done one engine upgrade, so it'll be a, probably a little while before I can probably con people into another engine upgrade. But nice, uh, we have one here from Mr. Ryan John. Uh, are most the objects in your immersive mix static, and how many and which objects do you typically move in a snapshot? Uh, good question. Uh, what I use. Snapshotting, mostly I'm just using, moving vocals around. Um, uh, my artists on stage are not generally moving in the horizontal field much. So uh, again, tracking or moving that around. But what I am doing a lot of, and this is actually something I really love about immersive is, especially with vocals, um, whoever the lead vocal is on that particular song, I usually have a snapshot for, I'll pull them forward in the um, room engine um, so that they become drier and more, you know, up front in your face. And then for the people that are singing backgrounds, they push back into that. So um, using MIDI at this point to, you know, SXL snapshots to the Elisa controller and then move those, generally try to do it on the on the Elisa controller with a little bit of crossfade. So if I miss my mark, it's I can do it more discreetly. <laughs> um, but, uh, but that's, um, I'm moving the vocals more in the um, artificial front to back space. Uh, I'm doing that a lot. Um, song to song or, or, you know, whenever that change makes sense inside the set. Um, not, and then sometimes too, if, you know, if I have two electric guitars, I'll have them panned out or in the field pretty far on the outsides. If, you know, it's one, if I'm switched to one, I'll maybe bring that a little more into center. Again, I'm trying to, as most as possible, reinforce where those people on stage. So when I, when I'm like moving a guitar like that, I'm not moving it, I'm moving like 10 degrees a little more just to give a little more center, centeredness to it. But, um, I'm really enjoying and, and really appreciate, again, the trying to make the acoustic or what comes out of the speaker correlate visually with where those artists are on stage. Yeah, right on. Right on. Awesome. Uh, how much do you, I'm sorry, how much does the immersive, how much has the immersive system changed your mixing workflows? Um, I'm still learning that. Um, uh, I would say, you know, before I was doing what a lot of people were doing in stereo. So I was, you know, I was do had really a bus based workflow. I was sending all inputs to groups and then processing them as groups. And then that's also how I was uh, at that point when I was doing everything from front of house, even with the um, broadcast, you know, using those, leveraging those stems to, you know, serve whatever need it is. Now, um, again, I've, I've gone fully, you know, this is where uh, L Acoustics set me up and I kind of haven't, I haven't played 
veered too far from that. I'm doing everything object-based. So that, of course, is uh, a, a big, so I'm not doing any um, bus bus compression on drums and stuff like that. Again, leveraging, I would say, what was a gift for Avid, <laughs> almost for me doing this, you know, I'm leading in hard to using the, um, especially these last few weeks of doing the parallel compression, especially on the drums, on the individual um, objects to get the, you know, the tonality or the sound that, you know, it, you kind of is, is used to with, you know, do you running that through a parallel path on a group? Um, so that's, I would say that's probably the biggest change. And then, uh, yeah, and then I'd say the, just being very conscious of, you know, hey, is that, that vocals over there, does that, is that where it's coming out above them? Just, just to give a lot of care and detail to that. Just to, because it does, I, I'd say, I think for the audience, it just it creates another level of engagement that's now with immersive cheap, so to speak. It's so easy for you to do it that why wouldn't you? And yeah. it's just, it just, yeah, it, it, I would say, especially with the spoken word, it definitely increases the amount of engagement to, you know, have those things, you know, visually and on, on, from an audio perspective correlate. You know, John, I'm going to, put a little bug in your ear and I want you to kind of listen for something as you're working through your workflows here, especially when you get to broadcast. Uh, I want you to listen for how, how much impact mixing immersive in the room has on your, uh, your ambience mics that are going to be used for your, for your stream, mm -hmm. right? See how that affects a, you know, a stereo pair or an XY pair uh, in a stream now, because, you know, it should be much more coherent uh, of a recording of that ambience now, because there'd be a, way less comb filtering in the space now. You know? well, actually, I've already noticed that because for, you know, for me to take home every night, you know, I've tried to, it's taken some time to kind of dial this in right, but I do have a pair of mics here in front of house. And then, yeah, once I got all the timing worked out on that, um, it was surprising, I can run those, I can put so much more room from the microphones into the mix right without, that's, it, without, without it destroying it um yeah. that was makes, my anticipation i i'm, I'm glad uh, to hear you I've say already, it, so. i've already felt that uh, yeah on the broadcast side again we're still tied, kind of figuring that out or dialing that in to perfection but uh i'm sure that will be an awesome side effect for, when, when doing it on the two bus side of things right i know i know just some of the church recordings that i've done in the past you know trying to get that that audience recorded correctly and have it also be a sense of ambience man it, it's a real challenge in mm -hmm. So many of these churches, you know, and primarily just because the the phase response of the PA system is so suspect in places. Yep. So. All right. Well, uh, Chant, unless we've got any other uh, burning questions there, that's putting us right on the hour here. I'll, I think we probably yeah. should try to wrap it up here. Sounds good. John, uh, thank you so much for coming in and sharing your uh, experiences with us and and what you got going on at. Uh, and Orchard Hill, that's really great stuff there. I'm really, really excited to see it out in the world and, and working, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I think it's kind of the future of where we're going in sound reinforcement for sure. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, I look forward to hooking up with you again and chatting with you some more about this mm -hmm. at some point. Thanks You're for joining welcome. us. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. All right, everybody. That We'll pull the pull the ripcord uh, at this point. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, you can look for the rebroadcast on uh, the Avid website, I believe. I'm sure there'll be some social media blasts and some email blasts directing you to that. But thank you all for attending today. Uh, it's great having a lot of people in the room for this kind of thing. So uh, thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.